Welcome back to General Chemistry 2. My name is Chuck White, and today we're going to talk about the enthalpy of expansion and contraction of gases. We're going to talk about a differential form of the first law of thermodynamics, and then we'll talk about expansion and contraction either as an isochoric process, or a process at constant volume, or as an isothermal process, uh, where we allow the uh, gas to ex expand during the, uh, during the process. We'll talk about adiabatic expansion and contraction, and then we'll talk more in general about arbitrary ch changes in the pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas. Now the first law of thermodynamics has the usual form delta U is equal to Q plus W, and usually as chemists we're interested in pressure volume work or PV work, and so we can write this as Q minus P delta V. And for very small incremental changes in heat or work, we can write a differential form of uh, the first law that says that DU is equal to delta Q minus P, d P dV. Now, there's a technical uh, aspect where I've used delta for the Q because heat is not a thermodynamic uh, function. Work is not a thermodynamic state function either, but volume and, and pressure are. And so um, we can calculate uh, du, which is a uh, state function, by the sum of a differential amount of heat and work. Uh, but the change in energy uh, doesn't really depend on whether we uh, add heat or work. Uh, and that's why heat and work are not state functions by themselves, but the sum of the two are. So in isochoric or constant volume heating, uh, we have W equals zero because delta, delta V is equal to zero. And we can write the differential form of the first law as DU is equal to DQ, which is equal to the heat capacity at constant volume times a change in temperature, DT. And so delta T, if we integrate, is equal to Q divided by CV. Now for an ideal monatomic gas like helium or argon, um, CV is equal to 3 halves R, or 12.471 joules per mole per Kelvin. So here's an example of an isochoric heating problem. If 813 joules of heat is added at constant volume to 2.2 moles of helium gas, which is initially at 25 degrees Celsius, what's the final temperature of the gas? Well, we know that delta T is equal to Q divided by uh, CV. Now CV is a molar quantity, so now we have to multiply by the number of moles, which is 2.2, and we can find that the change in temperature is 29.63 degrees Celsius. If we add that to the initial temperature of 25, we find that the final temperature is 54.63 Celsius. Now in isothermal heating, uh, that means heating at constant temperature. And for any ideal gas, uh, du is equal to CVdt, uh, which at um, constant heating, dt is equal to zero, so du is equal to zero. But that must be equal to the sum of the heat added and the work done on the system, uh, minus PdV. And so we can rearrange this equation to say that uh, dq is equal to PdV, which is equal to nRT over V times dV, just using the ideal gas law. Uh, we can further rearrange this to say that uh, Q, the integral form, is equal to nRT times the integral of dV over V, which is equal to nRT log of V2 divided by V1. So now the heat that's added in order to maintain a constant temperature during the expansion must be equal to nRT times log of V2 over V1. So here's an example. How much heat must be added to a 1.8 uh, mole sample of ideal gas at uh, 2 bar and 300 K in order to double its volume. Uh, so um, we have our equation Q is equal to nRT log V2 over V1. Uh, to double the volume, the, the ratio of V2 to V1 must be 2. So that's nRT log 2. And if you plug in the values for the number of moles n, the value of the gas constant, 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin, and the temperature, 300 Kelvin, uh, then we get the amount of heat that's necessary to maintain that temperature uh, during the isothermal heating is 3,111.9 3, joules. Finally, we turn to adiabatic expansion. Now adiabatic means Q equals zero, or an insulated system where we don't allow any heat to flow to or from the system from the surroundings. Uh, 
And so uh, we can write du as equal, uh, equal to delta w, uh, which is equal to minus pdv, because q now is equal to zero in the first law. And so we, we can write du as cvdt uh, from our uh, previous example. And so now uh, combining those two equations, we can write cvdt is equal to minus pdv. Now we have three variables here, temperature, pressure, and volume, but we really only need two for any ideal gas. So I'm going to substitute for the pressure nRT over V using the ideal gas law. And so we can rearrange this equation by putting everything involving temperature on the left-hand side and everything involving volume on the right-hand side, and then integrate both sides to get the final form CV log of T2 over T1 is equal to nR log of V1 over V2, where the only tricky thing I've done here is I have flipped the um, uh, V1 and V2 in the, in the logarithm and then canceled the negative sign that was in the equation just above it. So here's an example of adiabatic expansion. If 5.8 moles of helium gas is initially at 35 degrees Celsius and 75 liters volume, and it's then expanded adiabatically to 150 liters, what is the final temperature of the gas? So I can write my adiabatic expansion equation just as I had it on the previous slide. I know that uh, the heat capacity at constant volume for any uh, ideal monatomic gas like helium is 3 halves R and uh, I can substitute that in for CV. Don't forget to multiply by the number of moles because the heat capacity is the molar heat capacity times the number of moles. Uh, I have log of T2 over T1 where T2 is the thing that I'm actually looking for and T1 must be expressed in kelvins so it's 308.15 kelvins and then on the right hand side I have um, NR which is uh, 5.8 moles times the gas constant log of 75 divided by 150 which are my two volumes in the expansion and I can solve this overall equation for T2 which turns out to be 194.12 kelvins or minus 79 degrees Celsius. So um, now let's consider arbitrary thermodynamic pathways. Um, let's suppose uh, that we start uh, with a gas at 0.1 liter volume and 100 um, bars pressure and uh, we take it by some uh, arbitrary uh, thermodynamic pathway to a volume of 0.3 liters and uh, 72 bars uh, of pressure. What is the change in internal energy? Well, we can actually uh, consider this as the sum of two thermodynamic pathways, which we can calculate pretty easily. We know, um, first of all, that for any ideal gas, PV is equal to nRT. So for any amount n uh, of gas, we know the, uh, if we know the pressure and the volume, then we can calculate the temperature. And that's important because we now have a PV diagram, but for any point on this diagram, if we know the number of moles of gas, then we can calculate the temperature. And we can compute the change in internal energy or enthalpy of any ideal gas based on a combination of isochoric, isothermal, or adiabatic processes. So here in this diagram I've shown going from the initial point um, down to uh, on the blue curve uh, by an adiabatic expansion that lowers the temperature as we expand from 0.1 liters to 0.3 liters and I can calculate the heat and work um, done, I'm sorry, that's an isothermal expansion. I can calculate the heat and work done uh, in that process and they turn out to be equal and opposite and then I can calculate the amount of heat uh, that's added uh, from the bottom point to bring us to a final pressure of 72 bars um, and then I just add up the heats along that uh, that uh, two-stage pathway and that turns out to be 2838.6 joules and uh, the amount of work is just the amount of work that was done um, by the system on the surroundings during the isothermal expansion and that's minus uh, 1098.6 joules and the sum of the heat and work is equal to delta E or delta U uh, you'll sometimes see and that's 1740 joules so uh, in going from the initial state to the final state, the total change in internal energy is plus 1,740 joules.
So the next time we'll talk about uh, entropy, which is a thermodynamic state function that's associated with the disorder of a system.